This thing on impatience, I had a good look at uh, our, our electronic library and had a look through the news poll cycles and try to match them up with uh, turnover of leadership. Now, through the 80s, as Lindsay pointed out, we were a monthly polling outfit in The Australian, started in 1985, and before then, the Bulletin had the big poll. Now, polls have in the past played a role in, the, uh, in knocking off leaders. John Howard Mr. 17%, why does this man bother, was a big front page, uh, front cover article in the Bulletin in 87 and he pretty much lost his leadership. That was part of the reason why he lost his leadership, wasn't the only reason he lost his leadership. But what we observed from the early 90s, once we went fortnightly, you couldn't go through a term of Parliament without there being a leadership change and this was quite an unusual pattern. Uh, it began towards the end of the 80s, early 90s with the recession. So you could say the big economic shock might have been the thing that did it. But once we got into recovery, uh, it continued. So it wasn't, the, it wasn't the economy that was driving this thing. I hip hoc concerns one side and then another side, and I've been able to get traction with the public because the public were uh, scratchy. It was the way we went about reporting, uh, keeping score, and then reporting again uh, the business of politics. Now, at some point, it certainly didn't happen all overnight. I think this is all part of a, a longer trend. I think politicians started to watch what we wrote. We started to watch them watch us. We saw that they reacted to the polls. So what, what did we do? We read their actions through the polls. And I think uh, it's been a bit of a race to the bottom. No single individuals to blame. I think the medium, when we talk about media, I think we're talking about technology and this sort of incessant demand for new information this and i think in this era you know i'm going to skip forward now to the to the more recent period since about uh, september 11 2001 you know the um technology has accelerated media cycle we're in now is what 24 hour news cycle there has to be something new almost every hour now now, the business of politics can't operate on something new every hour. This is a very different sphere that we're in now. And what resonates through all this white noise? Not words, because there are a trillion of them, but numbers. Is the government up? Is the government down? Is the opposition up? Is the opposition down? Policies get announced. First thing we do, we put a poll on the field. Do you like this thing? Yeah, all right. You ask a question again the second time, do you like it? I don't know. Hang on a minute, the government's in trouble. This thing doesn't look like it's popular. A couple of weeks later, you say, well, I've got to ditch this. And that's really, it's tail wagging the dog thing and it's technology uh, reasserting or asserting a, a sort of level of veto over, over the substance, not just of politics, but also political reporting. Now, I don't know how you think your way out of this. Uh, this impatience that Lindsay refers to is now part and parcel of everyday life. Uh, you know, now that we're living a lot of our lives through the computer, uh, we are almost at this sort of <laughs> pre-Renaissance state now where a bit of information flicks up, I have a look at that, okay, I've got to sit down, I've got to write something, I've got to send this note, hang on a minute, something's just flashed up on my screen, hang on a minute, I've got to get up, make myself a cup of coffee. This, this sort of thing that we're involved in now is not healthy, but I think a lot of people recognise it, and I think a lot of people have been living it for a while, and I know you've made this point in the past that that the media itself is making it harder for governments to do stuff. Uh, like I say, I don't think it's any journalist's fault. I don't think it's any news organisation's fault. I think it's just the volume of, uh, of uh, words and the numbers and the noise that comes with it, almost exercising a technology-based veto over, uh, over long conversations. There's a, a book by Ian Ward about the Australian media which has a table of leadership challenges, state and federal, from I think about the mid-1970s through the late 1980s. And one of the extraordinary things about this table is that there is a success or fail tally against it all and there's probably you know, 20 or so uh, challenges and almost all of them succeed. Mm -hmm. Almost all of them succeed. And it now seems that the best way to win office from opposition is to become opposition leader as close as possible to the election which you're contesting. Before and someone comes after you. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. On so, your own side. Yeah. so Bob Hawke managed it brilliantly. Uh, Colin Barnett managed it brilliantly. And there are many examples, of which Kevin Rudd is one, of people who've successfully won government from opposition, in some cases after quite a lengthy period of their party being in opposition with only a relatively short time in opposition. Do you think the circumstances are now such that you're actually better off 
to bide your time. If, for example, you've got a leader who's been unsuccessful in an election, you're better off to let them stay in office post the election for a year or two, then knock them off, rather than become opposition leader straight away. You haven't looked over politics yet, have you? <laughs> this, is a, uh, this is a good strategic question. What works, obviously, is the, uh, is the challenge that turns up within a year or as close as possible to an election. It doesn't always work, of course, because uh, Mark Latham uh, didn't work. True. But uh, we know Tony Abbott came close. We know John Howard came close. Well, came close. He won in a landslide in the second time around. And we know Kevin Rudd won quite a comfortable majority for Labor in uh, 2007. Would you wait? Well, I think one of the problems, one of the problems of all these constructions now is if you lose an election and you think the result doesn't matter because you can turn your leader over, you, your opposition is never going to be ready for government when it, it's, it, its turn comes. So the business, the business of winning Everybody knows that game now, and I think both sides have got roughly the same information. They've got roughly the same take on the electorate um, because there isn't a policy contest between them. We know that we're actually in this sort of perpetual turnover phase. So you could sort of, you know, you could imagine a scenario where, the, where Abbott got up, either as a minority government or with a small majority of his own, and they would have lasted a term. Well, in fact, the last uh, person to win government at the national level from opposition after serving a full term as opposition leader was Gough Whitlam. Yeah. So I think that does speak volumes for yeah, this and dynamic. Did, and Gough, inter interestingly enough, had uh, two terms of remaking a party before he was ready to govern. This idea, this idea of, uh, of coming from opposition with an alternate program for government is very old hat now. Um, and that is really quite disappointing to my mind as an observer because uh, we've obviously just gone through a period with the Labor government that... Uh, had a lot of good sound bites, had a lot of policies. There were over 600 promises made in 2007. I think you itemised them all at some point. And uh, unfortunately, <laughs> wasn't the high point of my political career having to do that. <laughs> but this was, this, 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 was, this was essentially campaign material rather than a program for government, the way it translated. Uh, we won't go into too much detail on what went wrong in the first term because you're asking the questions. But this is... Um, <laughs> This is, in a sense, I think politics has learnt the easier of the two games, which is the game that the media always understood, which is how to create a distraction, how to make a lot of noise, how to basically hound somebody out of, um, out of a pre-existing position. The thing now, with all this noise around, is who can think their way through a campaign period and actually govern with some authority. Well, I suppose that's my next question. Is there going to be a swing back? Uh, usually in politics, when people start to get unhappy about something, a pattern of how things are occurring, then that becomes the fuel for a bit of a swing of the pendulum back in the other direction. So do you sense that there is likely to be a shift back? I think there has to be a shift back because I, I just can't see us running this sort of three litres a term churn. I just can't see it because I, don't see, I actually don't see the point in coming to work if, if I were in politics, knowing that at best I get a one, one and a half year shot at the leadership. And then, uh, and then somebody's coming after me, and knowing that the person that comes after me is going to have just as rotten time as I did. I think at some point there's going to be a collective reassertion of the authority of government and also the authority of, of an alternate government, the authority of ideas in opposition. But I don't see it happening anytime soon because one thing that the hung parliament has done is basically crippled both sides. Uh, I think both Tony Abbott and Julia Gillard looked at the election result and said, hello, they really don't like us. And uh, anyway, I might. <laughs> I and I really think the way, the both, I think the way both of them have, uh, no, I know they're both exhausted, but uh, and in fact, both sides are exhausted. I think they're not that confident yet how to reapproach the electorate, having just been given, you know, a collective kick, kick up the backside. Now, both yourself and Paul Kelly and one or two others have been putting a view that the age of reform is over. And... I think you identify around the turn of the century as about the time when <coughs> national governments in Australia are doing big, hard reform things that are politically challenging just ground to a halt. Uh, I'd like to tease out uh, a bit of that material. And first I'd like to ask you, what do we mean by reform? That's one of the things I've kind of grown to understand over the years is that 
your reform is my outrageous attack on human rights and vice mm. versa. Mm. Uh, and so what somebody sees as reform, somebody else is likely to see as outrageous, retrograde, yep. whatever. So I think there is a bit of a reform is in the eye of the beholder here. So if we are to be asserting that uh, there was a pattern of activity from, let's say, the early 1980s through to the late 90s or around the turn of the century that we describe as hard reform and we're saying that that's kind of ground to a halt. Well, what definition of reform are we using? What, what's our frame that tells us what we're talking about? Yeah. When I think reform, and uh, I don't obviously just think economic policy, I think anything that a government can see a long-term gain from, a national interest, but it's not going to pass the first test of an opinion poll. But through debate, argument, adjustment, adapt, adaption, public and government come out the other end with a, better, with a better sense of why this thing was done. And the thing actually, with the benefit of hindsight, gets a tick. Now, we use GST as a pretty good example because it never satisfied any opinion poll. The Australians through so many polls, so many different polls at the GST. Lindsay, you'd remember this. I, I framed half the questions and each time the Labor people would come back to me saying, you know, we're almost there, we're almost there. Not because we're tricking up the questions for a Labor result, but each time these questions were asked of the GST, it looked like it was a dog of a policy. Now, something happened. I mean, obviously in 2001, the Tampa came on the horizon and that wiped that debate clean. But at the 2001 election, and I have seen uh, Labor's internal research, and Auntie Tanner can't comment on this because he may or may not have seen it, the idea of rolling back the GST was a net negative for Kim Beasley. The idea that, that, an op, that an alternate government would walk up to the people and said, look, you've just gone through this thing four years, well, it was actually a 25-year journey by the time it became accepted, um, but by the way, I want to undo this whole thing. People, once they've been through these debates, do move on. I think climate change is going to be one of these issues when somebody finally nails it, uh, we'll wonder what the fuss was. Because I think a good two or three years into the GST, implementation, people were wondering what the fuss was about. Now, as I say, my definition of reform is something's obviously got to have a, a national interest. I don't score the GST highly in terms of its mechanics, but I do score the GST highly in terms of its politics. I mean, it wasn't intuitively popular, but it did give the government, the coalition government, an idea that it was standing for something, and it did shore up a bit of revenue. They chucked it away, obviously, in good times and didn't, uh, you know, didn't complete the transaction, to my mind, but, you know, I'm in the media, I'm in the sort of hard bastard part of the uh, spectrum, so I assume that governments don't know what they're doing. I don't assume that, but <laughs> I'm always going to score them. I'm always going to score them poorly, and it's obviously going to give you a window into uh, how we go about our business and how we're making these things worse, not better. <laughs> but as I say, I, it's, it's, something that, it's something that is intuitively hard because it's going to force people to adjust. But at the other end of this process, the place has to be better off. So I don't believe in reform for its own sake. I certainly, you know, I'm with the majority of the Australian electorate that work choices, A, wasn't sold to the electorate, but B, in its implementation, was, you know, close to the worst piece of public policy that we've seen in the last 30 years in terms of what it was, what it was trying to do um, um, to people's everyday lives. That's, I wouldn't call that reform because at some point, you don't, there's, no, there's no macro GDP upside that's going to cancel the fact that most people go to work and feel like they're going to have a crappy time. So, I mean, that's just to give you a sense of balance there. The, one of the, the great difficulties in this debate, I think, is that there are always voices advocating particular kinds of reforms who tend to go missing or are, in fact, recalcitrant when other kinds of reforms are put in place. So, for example, uh, it's taken the business community a very, very long time to get engaged with what is clearly the number one terrain for microeconomic reform in Australia, and that is the federal state schmozzle. Mm. Now, to the BCA's credit, Business Council's credit, they have become pretty hardline and pretty strong on that. Uh, so everybody in these debates is always pursuing self-interest and partisan positions and there is no purity. So how do politicians that are being berated for being timid and reactive and watching opinion polls, 
how do they manage to put together a, a coalition mm -hmm. of support or commitment to serious reform when the various groups in the community out there will always be barracking for their reform and fighting hard to stop the other guy's reform? Mm. Now, some of us are probably old enough to remember that uh, the 80s and the 90s was preceded by the 70s, which was our worst decade. Now, a lot went wrong over the course of that decade. A lot of fun in the 70s. Yeah, we all had a lot of fun as kids, but uh, the model broke. The Australian model broke, and, uh, you know, we uh, came out of a second recession within the space of five or six years with double-digit inflation and unemployment. At that point, and uh, Bob Hawke might pick to differ because I think he thinks he's genius, help bring the nation together. I think at that point, all vested interests looked at the national balance sheet and said, we can't continue down this path that we're on, which was essentially uh, every vested interest for themselves. So you had, you know, you had a systems failure leading to uh, some substantial um, cross-party and a cross-sector um, push for reform. We obviously don't have that now because we're obviously in a lot better place financially. Uh, you know, the place hasn't had a recession for close to 20 years. In fact, the anniversary of the recession we had to have press conference uh, falls next week. So the 20th anniversary for fiscal train spotters. So yeah. that, is a long, that is a long time. I you none of you knew that. <laughs> that is a long time for a society to be pretty much growing off its own steam. There are a lot of people who don't, just don't want to be touched. Now, to go to your question, because I'm obviously doing a bit of a scene set for why things did work a bit better in the 80s and 90s. There was a collective interest. Um, how do you get it done this time? Well, the last time it was done, and the last time it worked, sorry, it wasn't the last time it was tried, because the Labor government obviously did try a couple of things. The last time it was done, going back to the GST, John Howard had ruled out the GST going into the 96 election. He said never ever, it was dead and was over his dead body. Of course, within a year, uh, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry and the Australian Council of Social Services got together and said, well, the budget's in a mess. We've got to fix the revenue stream so we could start spending on our people. Business wanted the simplest tax system. The welfare lobby wanted uh, greater government spending. That was a, a sort of coalescing of interests which happened ahead of the government, but I think John Howard obviously allowed this thing to run ahead of him. Now, how does the government do it today? I think at some point, somebody gets behind closed doors with people that they think are interested in the national interest and work out whether they want to put the thing up the flagpole in the first instance. And it may be that governments have to lose this sense of, you know, sole authorship of reform. And it may be that they might have to find a way that it's not presidential genius that, that it's going to get us from A to B, but that a government can marshal a number of groups Make a few of them think that it was their idea. I mean, there are some dummies in the, um, in the corporate and in the um, welfare lobby sector that do think that every original thought in Australia has come from them. At some point, you might be able to let them think this. But I can't see it working any other way because you need the buy-in at the start from, the, from these groups. The idea of a top-down uh, reform agenda from government doesn't quite work at the moment because parliament and the government doesn't have the authority to be able to say, here's what I want to do. Um, are you with me or against me? That obviously didn't work in 2000, between 2007 and 2010. Uh, that means reimagining the way some of these debates are run and probably, you know, a government or even an opposition, because you can move these things from opposition, being big enough to, to share the credit with other parties. Without casting judgment on your thesis about the end of the age of reform, I think there's something that uh, I've had a view of for uh, several years that uh, I think is in your perspective here I'd like to get your view on and that is the Ross Garno great complacency thesis. Uh, for those who are not aware, uh, Ross Garno made a speech I think about two or three years ago where he dubbed the current environment, the atmosphere, the politics of Australia, the great complacency. Now I actually think he's bang on the money here and that uh, it is not a coincidence that reform has become harder for politicians of either party in the wake of the mining boom. And I look back to the 1980s and think, well, the critical thing here was that you had, within a relatively short period of time, the dreadful recession of 82, 83, 
the stock market crash, 87, the Banana Republic uh, incident in 1986, the Australian dollar falling to 47 cents US. Then, of course, you had another very, very deep recession in 1991. In my view, the mood in the Australian community was receptive to dramatic, unpleasant things because people had a feeling, well, yes, it is broke. Mm. Uh, and we may not particularly like what Bob Hawke and Paul Keating are proposing, but what would we know? Um, and yeah, yeah we're, we're a bit dubious about it all, but we do accept that something has to happen and it probably has to be something pretty serious. In my view, the it ain't broke, don't fix it mentality is one of the ten commandments of the Australian psyche, if there are such a thing. Don't ask me what the other nine are, but I probably work them out. on that, and they probably have something to do with property prices. Yeah, well, <laughs> property prices may have something to do with it. Uh, so I think one of the great problems that governments of both persuasions have had in confronting these issues in recent times is just a general sense of complacency in the community, which is characteristic of Australia throughout its history, yep. uh, which I think is the downside of being dealt a pretty good hand by geography and history, uh, and that some of the time we really luck it in, as we have in recent times, and the end result, of course, is that people, I think, tend to be not very receptive to anything being changed dramatically because they don't see the need for it. To what extent do you see that as a factor in the thesis you're putting forward. Yeah, I actually, uh, Ross is bang on the money on this because you take the long view of Australian history, take a 100 year view of Federation, the decades that's, that stand out, the ones out of the box of the 80s and 90s, are the side of that. And if you look at the story since 2001, and there's a particular transaction I have in mind, and I, I'll just mention it briefly, I think it ended in 2001 when John Howard gave the motor lobby more than they asked for on fuel excise. I think that was the moment where, and at that point, they were obviously in trouble in the polls, that was the moment where lobby groups took a look at the government and realised that the government was weak enough to be able to stop doing things. Now, any lobby group has picked up that lesson. We know that uh, ACT certainly picked it up with work choices. We know the miners went close to, to kicking a government out simply because they didn't want to pay more tax. Um, now, that complacency you know, obviously there has to be there has to be sort of um, you know some public consent for this sort of behaviour because I think this behaviour is without uh, sticking up for politics too much. But in this instance, I do want to stick up for politics. I think that sort of behaviour of vested interest is totally outrageous. The idea that you could take a government to the wire, whether it was the motor lobby against John Howard, whether it was the ACTU against John Howard again, or whether it was the miners against the Rudd government. The idea that any vested interest group, depending, you know, if it's got a membership base and some seriously deep pockets, this isn't the United States, thank God. Um, that whole idea is abhorrent to most of us in this room, but obviously there's a, a good 20 million Australians who don't care enough <laughs> to allow that sort of thing to happen. In fact, they probably enjoyed the sport in the, in the short term. So yes, that complacency is there. Now the thing, I, I'll give you a half cup full uh, take on this. The thing about the 2010 election result was the electorate was saying, inspire us. Politics said, you know, complacency is afoot. I don't want to scare people. I'm afraid of my own shadow. Geopologists jumped the wrong way. Um, what am I going to do? What am I going to say? Well, let's shrink the country. Let's talk about boat people. Let's have a citizen's assembly. I can't even remember all the other stuff. Now, I've just given up. Um, well, here's a good one. This one I always have to remind myself of. We'll tax business 1.5% so we can outbid Labor on a paid parental leave. Hang on, that's unpopular. Well, why don't we cut tax by the same amount? That happened to be one of the... That was the alternate government's Actually, policy. 1.7%. One, 1. It to started at 1.7 and it yeah, came yeah, out so at 1.5. Well... The thing about the great complacency is that the 2010 election result tells you that enough people cared enough to hang the parliament. And that we've got now this breakout movement, unusual in Australia, to the left of the mainstream political party, of the two main parties, that is, for the first time in our history, a pro-reform protest movement that pulls about 10% of the electorate. Now, pro-reform protests we've never had before. I mean, Find me, find me an example. One Nation, was that a pro-reform protest movement? I don't think that was. Um, was the DLP a pro-reform protest movement? Even the Australian Democrats was not a pro-reform protest movement. They were a keep the bastard honest movement. So the position of the Greens at the moment, and it has 
virtually nothing, and I've seen some exit focus groups that were done for why people voted Green, it almost has nothing to do with, you know, line by line adherence to Green Party mantra. It is this sense that the main parties just don't want to do stuff anymore. And if this is the way that we can shake them up, this is the way we're going to do it. So this is, well, we've been talking about the idea that the, that, that the system itself is broken in a way that isn't affecting people at the kitchen table. I, the governance system is broken. Now, obviously enough people have picked up on this to be able to affect an election result. So it's not that I want to leave you all on an optimistic note. I'd much rather we're a bit harder on them in the, in the short run so we don't have a repeat of an election like this. But it's possible that the public have already spoken and that there's enough of them that are ready to be inspired that one party or the other might, um, might uh, break a habit of a century. Well, now to the exciting bit and uh, where I put George on the spot mm. and, and the brief advertisement, uh, I've just finished or almost finished writing a manuscript for a book that will come out well in the next year, which is primarily about the role of the media in all of this. And, uh, and it's, it's a very balanced and fair-minded assessment, I can <laughs> hasten to assure you. Uh, although the rewrites that I have to do could actually make me a bit more choleric and angry than I already am. Uh, but nonetheless, there, there is a substantial question here which I'm looking forward to debating with people like George in due course. Uh, and I think one of the critical problems we have is the structural change in Australia's media where more and more serious analysis of politics and, and of issues is being squeezed out to the margins. And I, I feel that that is a major factor in the wider problem that George is identifying, that it's actually getting harder and harder for politicians to prosecute a serious argument about a major issue because they are so much under siege by gotcha journalism and by the, the distortion and, and asymmetric presentation of things that it, it just becomes so much easier to avoid those tough things because it's just getting almost impossible to prosecute a tough reform agenda that's likely to be unpopular. Uh, and, and very difficult to pursue. So I'm interested in George's comments on, uh, and I'm, I'm sure he can leave the Australian aside and talk about everybody else, talk about Fairfax, for example, uh, as your main competitors. But uh, I'm interested in George's assessment on what role has the media played in all of this and why is that happening? Yeah, well, it's, it, it's a good question. And it just to, I'm not buying time here because I know all the political tricks having observed them. But I'm First not, distraction, second, yeah. attack the interviewer, third, attack your opponents. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> um, fourth, repeat the question. Would you like some coaching on the techniques? No, 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 more no. importantly, <laughs> do, you think, do you think it started in 01? Do you think it's around that time? It's a turn of the century thing for the media as well as the practice of politics? Look, it's, it's hard to identify, and I think, and the work that I've done, you know, you, you can see that people have been complaining about this kind of thing for decades. Mm. And uh, but stuff's still got done in the past. People always complain about what a boring election campaign this is, but there was always a, a clarity of choice. Yeah. But, but I think probably the, uh, the interesting kind of change that people, I don't think, really have remarked on much except a few academics is the commercial TV current affairs shows. 30 years ago were pretty serious and had people like Mike Willisey and, and even 20 years ago asking pretty tough serious questions and playing a major role in public debate but with a you know a populist tone but nonetheless the content was fed income yeah. and what you've seen in recent times is this transition over to kind of national inquirerville where it's it's basically formulaic the tenant from hell, the nasty bureaucrat, the con man, the miracle cure for cancer, the miracle bra, and what's the last one? I've forgotten, but there's, there's about six stories and they just get run over and over and over again. Now, that transition, uh, which is also reflected in the demise of the Sunday show, uh, I think significant change in news bulletins. You can see that in newspapers as well. There has been a, a gradual shift away from serious content. Now, I couldn't necessarily say that, you know, around the turn of the century there was a marked difference. I just think there's been a, a slow, steady decline, and I think it's a, it's a very serious thing for Australian democracy. Yeah, now, I mean, the reason why I asked the question was not to 
because I really know what I think on this, but I was interested in your perspective of, of, of whether there was a, a moment where, it, where as a practitioner, you thought, well, hang on a minute, this thing is now out of control. Uh, uh, look, I, I will answer your question. The, the, uh, not, that, not that I've particularly identified uh, in the sense that I, I, don't, uh, I don't look back over my career and identify a, a tipping point. Uh, if I thought about it, I possibly could. Uh, and I think it's, uh, there's a whole lot of factors involved in this. Obviously, the new media yeah. and the pressures of the cycle just intensifying more and more and more. Uh, I, I think this is one of the, the, the factors that are, is influencing change in our community more widely is the combination of greater affluence together with a massive explosion in alternative options for discretionary time. Yep. So why don't people do things like join political parties and go to branch meetings anymore? Well, it's because the range of choice they've got for other things is massively greater, and typically their work pressures, if they are in employment, tend to be greater as well. well I think the same thing is applying to the media, that basically the, the media are, are competing now with you know everything from PlayStation to iPods, to, so it's not just competing with Twitter or whatever. It's actually competing with uh, an ever mounting range of other things that all of you can use your time to do, rather than read a newspaper. And I, I think that's really probably the key thing. One of the, I think one of the difficulties is, especially if we just take the here and now, um, it is possible now as a uh, as a human being to Google your own reality. I suspect, and that is. So you don't, because there's so much out there now, there's so much information now, and it doesn't take that much tech know-how to be able to just get caught in your own little world um, and to get it reinforced. So, because we're not all watching TV at the same time, you know, we don't have water cooler conversations anymore like we used to, because obviously life's a bit more complex. So that in itself is a bit of a problem, and I think that's one of the traps that both parties fell into when they were, when they were you know, seeking guidance from the disengaged and the focus groups. Um, they already had made up their minds about what they didn't like. They wanted to be told what to believe in because the rest of it was you couldn't convince them. But going down that tunnel, of course, politics decided, well, if they don't know what they're doing, I'm not going to do anything because I'm afraid of doing stuff. Now, that's, that's a manifestation of it. Let's zip it back a bit and let's go back to the glory days of print in Melbourne, which is when the old Melbourne Sun, my first employer in journalism, circulated about 630,000 a day and the Melbourne Herald had half a million in the afternoon. Now, Melbourne's population was what then? It was a couple of million, maybe a bit more. Victoria would have had about three or four million at best. That's a very high, that's a very high penetration for print in a, in a state and in a society, in a community. Now, I think the last paper in Australia on the mainland that goes close to that sort of penetration is the Western Australian in Perth. I think that might be the last, and that's, it's a long way behind what, what the Herald and the Sun had. And of course, in those days, if you come home from the footy on a Saturday afternoon, you'd get the last edition of the Melbourne Herald on the Saturday to see the three quarter time scores. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, the, and you'd get the Sporting Globe later on. you get the Sporting Globe. So. This thing called radio, and certainly the thing called the six o'clock television news, hadn't taken off at that point. But when they arrived, and especially, especially uh, the six o'clock news bulletins, it killed the afternoon newspaper. Now, the thing that print didn't understand that was happening to it almost from the day television knocked off the afternoon newspaper was that print in the mornings adjusted its voice to meet the challenge of television. See, I think each medium whether it's dumbing down or not, it actually changes the voice of the previous incumbent. So I think, you know, you saw this thing that a black and white newspaper was never going to thrive in the 80s when you got colour TV and you got the six o'clock news and you got many more eyeballs watching the six o'clock news and you got picking up the paper in the morning. So we, we got a bit more colourful, you know. So first, it's just the physical use of colour, but it's also in the language of this thing. So it got a bit racier because we're competing with, with pictures, which are very difficult things to compete with when you're writing. Now, the other big thing that happened, that was the first thing that knocked off the afternoon newspapers. The next big thing, I think, and it's a big cultural shift that's still underestimated in Australia, especially because it took off more in Australia than it has elsewhere, is talkback radio in the 90s. This is, a, uh, this is old media, but it became a new political genre in the 90s, and there's a particular group of voters that are on it all day. A prime minister, obviously, made his name on talkback radio, but what happened to us again? Now, I can tell you in the print game what happened was we started to type like Alan Jones. We started to shout. 
because shouting seemed to have this audience over here. Now this is, this is all, you know, it's not conscious. I just think it, you, have a, you have a form of media creep that's going on where the new entrant carves out a new market. We look at the challenge and we say, hang on a minute, maybe their voice is more powerful than ours now because it's picked up something that we didn't have before. Why don't we start sounding like them? And I think current affairs television has fallen into the trap much quicker than, um, than print has because we still have this idea, certainly in the Australian and the Financial Review, and you know, I don't want to pass judgment on the age in the Sydney Morning Herald, but until recently the age in the Sydney Morning Herald still had this idea that there was this idea of quality issues based journalism in print, whether you agree with the agenda or not, the fact, the fact of an agenda meant that you were still on the highbrow side of, um, of, of the media. Now you lose television, once you lose television, because television was, was serious when it first arrived because it, it was a newcomer and it was still looking to print for its cues, it lost, it lost its, its sort of uh, connection to, uh, to that more serious end of journalism because it found a much cheaper formula that was going to work for it. Um, a passive audience sits back and thinks, well, I actually don't care. You can cover the dismissal for me or you can cover the neighbour from hell. It's the same thing to me. You can unpack a GST and work out what the price um, of a birthday cake will be or you can do the neighbour from hell for me. You know, between the 93 and the 96 elections, the big thing that happened in current affairs was the Paxtons were out as dole bludgers. That's right. And from that point on, I think current affairs probably jumped the shark because it was just too easy, I think, at that point to do that. Now, we all have all adjusted our language that way, i.e. to the more popular stand simply because of the new entrance. The thing that the internet has done though, and it's not just Twitter and it's not just the in instantaneous news, the internet has bamboozled uh, print. It's also bamboozled television. Free-to-air television is more bamboozled than, say, our company is. I think any of the free-to-air networks really don't know what their business model is because who's going to book an ad on a TV station to pay for the journalism or to pay for the soapy or to pay for whatever? I mean, you reach a point where everything is out there and the only way to rebuild your market, having had your monopoly smashed, is quality. Now, on media, I am an optimist. I think the media is going to self-correct well before politics does, simply because, you know, people, even though the market is fragmented, there's still going to be a pretty strong market for words, for ideas, as there is a market for trash, as there is a market for, um, you know, for middle-of-the-road stuff. So... But I think, you know, this, is, this has been 30 or 40 years coming. Last question from me, and it's a, a very brief one. As a dedicated fan of George's writing, and I'm sure there are a number of you in the audience who describe yourself in the same way, there's one really disappointing thing about this. There's no statistics in it. <laughs> now, I have relied on George for years as the bloke who can tell me <laughs> that in three suburban Adelaide marginal seats, 27% uh, of people were on family payments between the income levels of 45 grand a year and 55 grand a year. And uh, because John Howard increased them by $1.50 a week, that meant they, election, they, yeah. they switched their vote from <laughs> Liberal to Labor or vice versa or whatever it was, you know, you know the story. I'm really disappointed that George has rejoined the humanities. And I'd like to know where the statistics have gone. <laughs> it's mining states for the, versus the rest. That was the only statistic I needed for the 2010 <laughs> election. Um, well, Black Ink uh, got me to think a bit differently for this one, so you can uh, thank or blame the publisher. Um, you've just reminded me, though, you and I didn't get in the index of the Latham Diaries, but it was for a statistical exercise that he actually mentioned in the diaries but forgot to index. Well, there a you long, go. A long, long time ago. Well, he bagged uh, us both, yeah, yeah. But, um, but we weren't in the back, yeah. you know. <laughs> not, not seriously enough to qualify <laughs> going into the index with all the other people that he bagged.